puzzle. What is this animal? This is the Rosetta Stone of meat eating dinosaurs. And there is no such a thing as a Rosetta Stone in science. This is an exploration full of intrigue and uncertainty. What seems obvious one moment isn't so the next. What impact will this creature have? And what secrets will it reveal that could change paleontology forever? Follow the adventure of one of the most remarkable scientific finds of the last century. Follow us on the trail of the mystery dinosaur. of years before man will walk the earth, the death of this creature sets the stage for a modern day controversy. In the rugged, fossil-rich terrain of the Hell Creek Formation, a team of mostly amateur paleontologists who have never been in the field before are nearly out of time. It is the last day of their two-week expedition and they have little to show for their efforts. But luck is on their side when two members of the group find several toe bones and lower extremities from a carnivorous dinosaur. Well, right now all that we really know about it is that it's a mating dinosaur, a theropod, from the build of the bones, we believe it's something lightly built, something that was probably a pretty fast runner. But we really don't know beyond that what kind of meat-eating dinosaur that we're dealing with. At first, the team believes they may have found a Tyrannosaurus rex, but the slightness of the bones baffles them. Basically, what we're doing is winterizing this site, getting the bones ready. We're giving them a good thick coat of Vinac. Vinac is polyvinyl acetate crystals and an acetone mixture that preserves the bones. We'll cover them with foil, replace the overburden that we've removed, and uh, come back in the spring and hope for the best. Because they've run out of time and it's late in the dig season, the team must weatherproof the bones and reluctantly leave them, anxious to return the following year. Working quickly and efficiently is of the essence as they prepare the site for the harsh Montana winter. Today the conditions in southeastern Montana are barren and inhospitable, but it was not always this way. In the late Cretaceous, Montana was a very lush, temperate tropical environment, uh, much more like the Gulf Coast states we see now, uh, Florida in particular. There were ferns and cycads and sequoias and some other primitive plants. We also see fossil crocodiles, fossil turtles, uh, fossil uh, rays and skates, so things that you don't see now and things that we can see by interpreting the fossil record. These lush settings were an ideal habitat for a myriad of animals, including dinosaurs. But it wouldn't last. In May 2002, the crew returns to excavate the skeleton. Paleontology has a rich history of amateurs finding important fossils, and this was no exception. As one of the volunteers, Carol Tuck remembers how she ended up with the group that made the discovery. My husband decided we were going on the dig out to Montana. <laughs> and um, I wasn't opposed to it, but it wasn't my kind of trip. I was a little leery about, you know, what it was going to be like. It was, it ended up being really a lot of fun. And it was an, an interesting group of people. 
The team includes an assortment of participants from varied backgrounds, each hoping to gain hands-on experience working in the field. These volunteers are equipped with curiosity and enthusiasm, though most with no expertise in science. Their goal is to find a significant fossil to take back to their museum. Little do they know, the odds are heavily stacked against them. So we returned to the dig site in the summer. I had 12 volunteers with me who had never uh, dug for dinosaur bones before. We spent three solid weeks using picks and shovels, uh, working our way down through 12 feet of overburden uh, to the bone bearing layer. Well, that three weeks time told us one thing. Uh, this was not fun work. This was the, kind of the miserable part of it. We had extreme temperatures, long days, people were getting tired, people were getting frustrated, and we thought there's got to be a quicker, a faster way, an easier way to do this. And we found one. The team uses a backhoe to carefully remove excess earth from around the site. Now they have a clear path to where the bones are buried. Once we got it there, things really quickened. I mean, we were able to get down to the bone layer, we were able to see what we had, and start working with picks and, and awls and really trying to figure out how much of this animal we had, because that was the million dollar question. As they continue to remove earth from around the skeleton, they believe they may have found something fairly complete, though they are cautiously optimistic. So we got down to the bone bearing layer and things were looking pretty good for us at that point. We had a lot of bones. It looked like we had most of a dinosaur skeleton preserved at the site, but we weren't sure what kind of dinosaur this was, what kind of skeleton we had. Mike had yet to realize what an exceptional find he and his team had made and that it would be a long time before he or anyone else could positively identify the creature they had uncovered. Great care is taken in preparing this animal for its first move in millions of years. All right, we have about eight meters this way, two meters out. All right, how about if you can hand me the tape? Start walking outwards. The uncovered bones are treated using a method that has changed little over the past century. The exposed area is covered with foil, followed by multiple layers of burlap soaked in plaster. This process forms a durable, protective cast. Wood framing is then added to make transportation in this remote region possible. While some of the bones, including vertebrae, the lower right jaw, and several foot bones are jacketed and transported separately, most of the remains of the dinosaur are contained in a 4,000 pound chunk of rock called the pod. It would be difficult and time consuming to remove the bones individually as they are buried so closely together, some right on top of each other. The decision is made to remove as much of the specimen as possible in this one large piece to avoid damaging the skeleton. Eventually, the pod makes its way to a flatbed and then a moving truck en route to its new home. We gave the specimen a field identification or field name of Nanotarantula census, a very rare and controversial dinosaur. We based this field identification on similarities we saw in the tooth shape and tooth structure, as well as skull bones that were similar to this nanotyrannus, this so-called pygmy tyrant. This is one of the rarest dinosaurs ever found. The team has hit the jackpot, or so it seems. This animal could very well be the elusive nanotyrannus, or it could be something equally as rare, a juvenile T-Rex. Now the journey for both the dinosaur and the crew who found it is about to take some unexpected turns. This is Rockford, Illinois, located on the Rock River 90 miles west of Chicago. 
Since 1941, the Burpee Museum of Natural History has remained a cultural focal point in this community. As the museum prepares for its arrival, Rockford welcomes and embraces this exciting dinosaur, now known as Jane, named for a museum benefactor. This is Rockford's dinosaur. Rockford people found it. Well, Rockford's never seen anything like Jane before, and I think what Jane has done for Rockford is help give this community uh, a little bit of faith in itself. Suddenly, this modest museum becomes a destination for paleontologists and dinosaur enthusiasts from around the world. Oh, you wouldn't believe how excited I was when I saw these bones. And this is one of the top specimens of a carnivorous dinosaur to come out of the late Cretaceous. Amidst the fanfare, a long-standing controversy is reignited. Is this a Nanotyrannus or a juvenile T-Rex? For years, they have been listed as separate species on the dinosaur family tree, but there are some who believe they are the same animal. In 1941, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History collected a small tyrannosaur skull in southeastern Montana. Now, this single skull has sparked a lot of debate and controversy over the last 60 years. It's gone through several name changes and redescriptions. In the late 1980s, it was named Nanotyrannus lensensis, the pygmy tyrant. Well, that name hung for about 10 years when it was redescribed as a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. But the interesting thing is that these paleontologists were arguing over one skull of one specimen. And really, that's why we're excited about Jane, is because Jane has the potential to have so much more material for all these uh, paleontologists to argue about. My first impression of the bones of Jane, which I've just had a chance to see, is that it is likely going to solve the riddle of Nanotyrannus. It's, it's complete enough, there's enough of the specimen there, that uh, you have a very good chance that you're going to resolve the whole problem of whether Nanotyrannus and Tyrannosaurus rex are the same animals or not. Finding itself at the center of a scientific firestorm, the Burpee Museum sponsors the Great Dinosaur Debate in an effort to present all sides of this controversy. It's a great big thing for crunchers. This would have to happen, correct? Reduced tooth count and great fat teeth. I've been writing up the morphology of Tyrannosaurus teeth, and teeth are so labor intensive that I have no problem saying that I hate teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have a skull. Why is this the first Nanotyrannus skeleton that's been found? Because Nanotyrannus is a smaller dinosaur. Smaller dinosaurs are, there's a preservation bias in the Hell Creek. Sedimentation was not very rapid in the areas where we collect, therefore not very many fossils get preserved. If you're something as big as a T-Rex, it takes a really big flood to wash your bones away. Dinosaurs go through changes that would as are astonishing compared to living mammals or living birds. I mean, an adult T-Rex is a six-ton animal, and yet it came out of an egg that's you know, not much bigger than this. Very little is known about dinosaur ontogeny a term that describes the changes in body form that occur with growth. This is especially vague with regard to the Nanotyrannus juvenile T-Rex controversy, because in either case, Jane is the only skeleton ever found. The similarities between Jane and the Cleveland skull may be related to growth, and they may still both be juvenile T-Rex. Even though most of the bones haven't been exposed yet, this skeleton has already posed many questions. With Jane's identity in doubt, it becomes obvious that it's time to take a closer look at all the evidence at hand. Whatever lies within the pod is ready to emerge. Now the real work begins. The plaster jacket is opened, and the team carefully sifts through the Montana sand and rock, called Matrix. It's trending down. I think we'll just be at the surface of it, looks like. Because I don't see any bone. Yeah, yeah I don't see any bone here. Right there you are. There it is. It's not going up there. Yeah, it is. A little bit. No, the question not. remains. Will the evidence within the pod reveal Jane's identity, and in doing so, 
solve one of the oldest mysteries in paleontology. for the ancients, the team uses good old-fashioned detective work to process the voluminous evidence before them. While painstaking, this approach will take them one step closer to solving this mystery. But who knows what happened to the top of the tree? It's right here. I'm just going to say A webcam, or dinocam as it's called, gives outsiders the opportunity to witness this progress in real time as Jane is slowly revealed. Meanwhile, innovative techniques in fossil recovery and reconstruction are implemented in the museum's preparation lab. For example, an air abrasion unit uses baking soda to gently remove debris from specimens too delicate to work on with conventional tools. Uh, that can be Each very, bone seems to have a story, or is part of a greater one. Long, but, uh, doesn't it seem a little bit long, proportionally, to be a finger bone to a Tyrannosaurus Rex? If that's Jane's finger bone, she had very long uh, fingers. And that could be important, because uh, if they're longer than in a Tyrannosaurus Rex, it may mean we're dealing with another kind of animal. So, I think it's a very important bone. That's a good discovery. So. Would you care if I gave Seeking Dr. expert Spears advice, they learned that this finger bone no, is exactly actually a toe bone. I'd call them right away. So these are the kind of things that uh, sometimes happen um, in paleontology, and uh, you know, we're only human. <laughs> because of the importance and rarity of Jane's skeleton, a special set of two-part molds are created. First, a clay base is built around each of the most important bones. Silicone rubber is poured to make the mold. This liquid gets into every crack and crevice and when set, becomes an exact replica. Hard plastic casts are then made. Burrs and edges are cleaned so that the reproduction can be handled and studied in place of the actual specimen. These will be sent to scientists all over the world. As we were uncovering Jane's skeleton, we realized that the bones were in their natural relationship to each other, that is, they were in articulation. And what that implies is that Jane's body was buried relatively soon after she died. There wasn't a lot of time for scavengers to come in and tear her body apart. For Jane's body to be buried quickly, she would need to have died near a water source like a river or a stream. As rigor mortis set in, her ligaments tightened, pulling her body into what is called the classic dinosaur death pose, head and tail curved toward each other. Soon afterwards, Rain flooded the water source, which washed sediment over Jane's dead body and protected it from scavengers. This process blanketed and shielded her bones, which became fossilized over millions of years until erosion finally exposed her. Jane was preserved in the Hell Creek Formation, which is a good thing because we have some of the most superb preservation in any dinosaur fossil in Jane's bones. Over time, the team is finding that this dinosaur is one of the most intact tyrannosaurs ever found. With only minor bones missing from the ribs, tail, and lower extremities, she is nearly complete. One aspect of her identity, her gender, is something that science is unable to determine at this time, though theories exist. Back at the dig site, more information is being uncovered about this dinosaur and the environment in which she lived. What I'm doing here is I'm uncovering a plant layer. 
how old the Jane site is. So between the pollen and the leaves, we can actually reconstruct the environment in which Jane lived. For southeastern Montana to go from a tropical haven to this barren landscape takes some explaining. Kirk Johnson of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science describes where Jane lived and why the world she inhabited changed forever. The KT boundary is an abbreviation for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. It's that point in time when the Cretaceous period ended and the tertiary period began. It happened 65.51 million years ago. But this was one of the most important events that's ever happened on planet Earth. It records a time when North America was struck by an asteroid that was probably about the size of Denver, Colorado, about 10 kilometers in diameter moving at 20,000 miles an hour. Immensely large rock struck the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and made a crater that's 180 kilometers wide and deep enough to crack the Earth's crust. Profound event, one of the largest asteroid impacts ever recorded on the planet. And this event appeared to have a major effect in the world's plants and animals. find dinosaur fossils abundantly below the, um, in the rocks that were deposited before this event happened and not in rocks deposited after this event. It's for that reason we propose the theory that dinosaurs were killed by events related to the asteroid impact. If we look closely at the KT boundary layer, we see evidence of microtectites, tiny glass beads that rain down on the planet after the asteroid impact. Using this information, scientists are able to determine the age of the site where Jane was found, and therefore, how old her skeleton is, 66 million years. Kirk Johnson's discussion of the asteroid impact explains the stark conditions of modern-day southeastern Montana, but as scientists reconstruct the environment when dinosaurs walked the Earth, they also get a better idea of what Jane was like when she lived. Evidence suggests Jane was a ferocious predatory animal. In the rough and tumble world of the late Cretaceous, the nastier the creature, the greater its chances for survival. Peter Larson, founder of the Black Hills Institute, puts it best. This animal was fast. Unlike an ostrich, this animal also had big teeth. So this animal was something that if you saw it coming, you'd run away, and uh, you wouldn't make it. It would catch you, and it would kill you, and it would eat you. With the scent of nearby prey in the air, Jane and her pack decide to move in. It's a world of eat or perish, and with numbers comes strength. In this case, it allows this group to ambush the unfortunate Triceratops. The Indian 
Indianapolis Children's Museum, the remains of a triceratops may give us a glimpse as to how Jane hunted. There's one specimen that we collected out in, in, in Wyoming we call Kelsey, which is a triceratops skeleton. And with that skeleton, we found 20 plus shed teeth. Now, a nanotyrannus skull has only about um, something like 60 teeth in its skull at one time. So you lose 20 teeth in one feeding, you're not going to be feeding very often because it takes two to three years to replace that tooth. But the problem is behavior rarely fossilizes. We can't see exactly how this triceratops died. Was it run down, hunted, and killed by a pack, a single individual? Did it die of old age? And did someone else come along on nanotrans and feed on? How this occurred, how this animal died, we can't say. Jane was equipped with the right tools for hunting. With forward-facing eyes, it's probable she had binocular vision and acute depth perception. In addition, features in her skull indicate she possessed a keen sense of smell. And of course, there's the teeth. This is going to cut, this is going to fillet you. If you're a dead dinosaur, Jane would come by and neatly, precisely cut meat off the bones. Whereas a T-Rex will come by and just smash the bones to bits. Whether or not Jane and her species hunted in packs, they were formidable killing machines. As in most predatory groups, there is dominance hierarchy, or a pecking order, when it comes to feeding. It appears as though the pack won't be able to finish what it started. guys could clamp on, hold on to their victims, and pull and tear to rip out chunks of meat. And there are tooth-marked bones to help support that um, evidence that's also come from the skull design itself. Some of the world's foremost dinosaur experts begin to examine Jane's bones and assist in determining her identity. It's a virtual who's who of paleontology. Peter Larson is one of the first to work with T-Rex bone pathologies. Robert Bacher helped reshape modern theories about dinosaurs. Jack Horner is one of the best-known paleontologists in America. Paul Serino has discovered dinosaurs on five continents. Tom Holtz and Pete McAvicki specialize in the evolution of theropod dinosaurs. Phil Curry is one of the world's most influential tyrannosaur experts. Thomas Carr is one of the most cautious skeptics of the nanotyrannus theory. Rather than solidifying their opinion regarding Jane's identity, there's even more division among these experts. You guys at the Burpee Museum have the only good specimen ever found of Nanotyrannus. I think most people pretty much come to the conclusion that it was a juvenile Tyrannosaurus. So you might want to call this ultimately Tyrannosaurus lancensis. Well, at least we're all sure she's a dinosaur. If Jane's skeleton is that of a young T-Rex, she will be the only specimen in existence and will help answer questions regarding the growth and development of the Tyrannosaur family. But if she's something else, she will help to shed light on the still murky dinosaur hierarchy of the Cretaceous period. Mike and Scott try to pin down Jane's identity. And any other Tyrannosaurid except uh, the Cleveland skull, namely it's this large opening here, this foramen. Mm -hmm. And the only other place I've ever seen it is on this Cleveland skull here, you can see right there the hole is almost an identical spot. I know people have thought that might be some kind of a bite mark, but obviously Jane has it too. And it's not a bite mark in Jane, not from the way it looks to me anyway. But Well, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things that they first talked about was that it could be a pathology. And I think I, I agree with you that there's just no way, the chance of both of these being a pathology in the same spot is very, very unlikely. The scapular blade, the shoulder blade that extends up the back. Again, immediately, it didn't look it didn't look anything like a Tyrannosaurus rex. It was much broader. So, for us to go from 17 teeth in the lower jaw of 
this animal to an adult-sized Tyrannosaurus rex, which only has 13 teeth or less in, in the jaw, doesn't make sense to me. We know this is T-Rex. What is this? These characteristics seem to differentiate Jane from T-Rex, and these are the main features scientists will focus on while making their determination. One aspect that is yet to be clarified is whether Jane is a juvenile or a fully grown animal. Her skeleton measures seven and a half feet high at the hip and 21 feet long, far taller than an adult human. But compared to an adult T-Rex, Jane was roughly half the size. In Jane, we see some fusion in some of her bones, which initially would lead us to believe that she was an adult animal. But then as we started to prepare her more and look at more of these bones, we realized that there was a lot of bones that were not fused, which may indicate that she's a juvenile. When Nano Tyrannus was first named, they said that, uh, that they CAT scanned it and it looked like it was all fused together. Well, it's all together, but it's not fused together. In fact, our biggest tyrannosaurs fall apart. I mean, they're not fused together either. An important development unfolds. Greg Erickson, a noted paleobiologist at Florida State University, conducts a groundbreaking tyrannosaur bone growth experiment, the results of which may have a large impact on determining Jane's identity. So what we do is we utilize growth rings that we find in the skeletons of dinosaurs. These, these animals, very much like living reptiles today, laid down annual growth lines uh, in their skeletons. In other words, their growth slowed down for part of the year. And this left a distinctive mark in their skeletons. It's, it's very much like uh, counting tree rings is, is the way it works. Uh, you, can, you can count up those rings and figure out how old an animal was at the time of death, just as you can do the same with a, with a tree. Uh, so what we do is we actually uh, literally select bones from these animals and, and cut them open, and we count up those growth lines. But it's not such a simple process of just looking at them. Uh, the, the, the rings are actually microscopic. And so what we do is we'll cut a bone open, and we'll take another cut out of it and make a slice place that on a glass uh, microscope slide. Then we'll sand and polish that down to a very thin level so we can see light through it. And then we'll put it on a microscope. And uh, through the microscope, we can actually push light through the specimen, and then we can actually see the growth lines. And then we count them up. And the total count, of course, gives the total age of the animal at the time of death. Jane was 11 or 12 years of age at the time of her death. Uh, if we look at the size of Jane relative to that age, this animal plots right on the Tyrannosaurus rex growth curve. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that Jane was a Tyrannosaurus rex, it just means it's consistent uh, with its developmental size with Tyrannosaurus rex. According to Dr. Erickson's research, Jane is a juvenile. This means that if Jane and the Cleveland skull are the same animal, Nanotyrannus is not the adult species it was originally described as. At 11 or 12 years old, Jane is still growing at the time of her death. Does this make her a juvenile T-Rex? Or do her bones tell us she's a different kind of animal altogether? The time has come to get some answers. Through research and data, the scientists have constructed a fairly good impression of how Jane lived. But if she was a juvenile, what caused her to die so young? Citing a formation on one of Jane's toe bones, there is speculation an injury occurred that seriously altered the course of her life. So we showed Jane's toe bone to a pathologist. He took a look at it. And based on the form of the injury, he thought we might be dealing with something called an osteochondroma. And one of the ways that would form is if a, a ligament or a tendon pulled away from the bone, taking a small bit of the surface with it, uh, then you would have this weird lump grow in response to that. When that injury occurred, the tendon pulling away from the bone would have been very painful to Jane. In order to take their investigation further, Mike Henderson and Scott Williams visit radiologist Dr. Christopher Vittori at Rockford Memorial Hospital. As you know, we've got this new dinosaur that we're working on, and one of the things that we found was this interesting toe bone here. He has this weird growth or bump on the side, and we had a pathologist look at it, and he thought that it might be 
some type of tumor. However, you know, the only way to be sure would be to look inside, and we don't want to cut it open, obviously, so the other option would be to have it CT. Well, this certainly could be a, a bone tumor, uh, especially based on its external characteristics. Why don't we take a look at the inside and see if that also supports a bone tumor diagnosis? We use a CT scanner and take a look inside. We just put the bone on the table for the CT scanner and it moves slowly into the hole in the center called the gantry. As it moves in, um, it will acquire images that are very thin section. It will acquire 100, over 100 images across the bone and we'll be able to see the internal characteristics on each slice. Yes, this is one of the representative slices through the bump on the bone. And remember, we use hundreds of these and let the computer put them together to create this 3D model of the bone. And you can see the bump right here. So this is very abnormal. We also had the computer reconstruct kind of a slice right through this area, through this black spot, so that you can see this type of slice. And you can see here that um, this isn't really a, a bone tumor at all. This has a typical appearance for a bone infection, a subacute bone infection. There's even a few tiny bone fragments within the cavity. And it has kind of a channel configuration, which is a typical thing we see with bone infection or osteomyelitis. So this actually might be debilitating to a, an animal like, uh, like Jane? Sure, it would probably affect the uh, hunting abilities and the diet probably the uh, overall health and strength of the animal. The CT scans reveal a structure within the bone infection never before seen in a dinosaur. Dr. Vittori confirms the team's suspicion that this injury may very well have led to Jane's eventual demise. In February 2005, Jane's reconstructed skull is unveiled to the public at the Burpee Museum's annual PaleoFest. From this skull, a life-size bust of Jane is commissioned. Tyler Keeler applies a combination of science and art, as well as techniques he uses as preparator and paleoartist in Paul Serino's lab at the University of Chicago. Since no one really knows what dinosaurs looked like, the inspiration comes partly from modern-day animals and partly from his own imagination. Did dinosaurs have lips? What was their skin like? What kinds of markings and colors did they exhibit? For the time being, we can only guess. The construction of Jane's head finally enables us to look this creature in the face, while still uncertain of her true identity. Well, when it comes to identifying what Jane and by default what the Cleveland Skull really are, I don't envy Mike at all. And it's like a puzzle. I mean, you've got to put all these pieces into place. And you also have to stay true to scientific theory. Because ultimately what we're looking at is we're looking for the truth. And we're trying to come up with the best possible answer for this question. What is Jane? Through the research, and with the help of scientists from around the world, Mike Henderson and his team are able to eliminate certain characteristics from the list that once appeared unique to the specimen. This is Jane's maxilla, and here we have the maxilla of an adult Tyrannosaurus rex. And the interesting thing is that the length of the T-Rex tooth row in the adult is not that much greater than the length of the tooth row in Jane but there's a reduction in the number of teeth. Jane has 15 teeth here in her maxillae. Uh, this maxilla of an adult has 11 teeth. And what appears to be happening is if we turn this around, we can look at the teeth of the adult and they are much more massive than the teeth of Jane. So what appears to be happening is while the, the jaw is increasing in length, the teeth are increasing much faster. 
And so there's not enough room for the 15 teeth that Jane has in the maxilla of the adult. She's got to lose some, and so the tooth number is reduced to 11. That's what I think is going on here. These are now viewed as ontogenetic or developmental changes and became evident only after examining juvenals of other dinosaur species from many other collections. The only extraordinary characteristic that remains is the quadratajugal located at the back of the jaw. It is distinctive in Jane and the Cleveland skull alone and has not been seen on any other dinosaur. However, I don't think that that one single feature is enough to justify calling them a separate kind of animal. In June of 2005, after two years and more than 10,000 hours of preparation and research, the moment of truth arrives. Jane's permanent exhibit, Diary of a Dinosaur, officially opens at the Burpee Museum and Mike Henderson identifies Jane as a juvenile Tyrannosaurus Rex. As expected, this declaration is not universally accepted. Even though everybody was sure when Jane was found that, okay, this is going to end the debate, it didn't. I, I think that, you know, now we need a few more specimens before people are going to really understand what's going on with this, with this dinosaur. I'm still convinced that Nanotrannus is a valid genus, and um, in a way I guess it's, it's, it's okay, because the longer that debate continues, the more we're going to learn about this really, really interesting fossil. The, the trail to the answer is going to be getting more complete specimens until we can really say that these collections of features that characterize Nanotyrannus or Tyrannosaurus rex simply are not accommodated in the life history of Tyrannosaurus rex. When that surfaces as the answer, we will have more than one large predator at the end of the Cretaceous. As the debate over this animal's identity continues, the Burpee Museum and Northern Illinois University host the world's first symposium dedicated solely to the family of Tyrannosaurs. During the symposium, some new and important research is disclosed. Surprising CT data now exists showing there are dramatic differences between the brain cases of the Cleveland skull versus that of an adult T-Rex. Well, we went in when we started our, our, our CAT scan project on the Cleveland skull, expecting to sort of uh, support the current notion that, that these, this animal, uh, the Cleveland skull, and by extension, Jane, were juveniles, young animals of the species Tyrannosaurus rex. And what we found was that some fairly profound differences between the Cleveland skull and not just Tyrannosaurus rex, but even other Tyrannosaurus species, suggesting that this animal was, was more distinct uh, than we had thought. And from our standpoint, it's very difficult for us to sort of accept that the differences that we see um, could somehow change through growth into what we see in, in Tyrannosaurus. It's almost too much change for us to expect. According to Dr. Whitmer, Jane cannot be a T-Rex after all. This startling data sends ripples through the scientific community. I was relatively secure that, that Nano Tyrannus was just a juvenile T-Rex. But just today, I saw some new information presented from CAT scans of the brain case, um, and of the air sac chambers inside Nanotyrannus that show it's very different from all other T-Rexes studied so far. Comparing an adult T-Rex skull to the Cleveland skull shown to scale here, one of the primary differences is the orientation of the inner ear canal, the organ that provides the sense of balance. The T-Rex displays a horizontal head position that is common among Tyrannosaur specimens, while the Cleveland skull has an unusual downturned head posture. Taking a closer look inside, the inner ear and air sinuses in T-Rex are situated next to the brain. In the Cleveland skull, these same features are located far to the side of the ear. Additionally, this skull exhibits bizarre anatomy not found in any other dinosaur. Just when scientists are convinced Jane is one animal, evidence surfaces that may once again steer them in another direction. As far as what Jane is, I have to say I really don't care. Uh, that was settled 66 million years ago when she hatched out of an egg in southern Montana. My job is to look at the evidence of her bones, try to decipher what they're trying to tell me. 
Uh, does the evidence indicate that she's a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex or a different sort of animal altogether? In a debate as volatile as this, questions remain. Is there ever really a definitive answer in science? And with all this information and experience, what is the true goal here? Is it simply to identify this dinosaur, or is there more at stake? Controversy, curiosity, evidence, mistakes. These are elements that compel scientists to seek the truth. Our science is, is in some ways more of an art than a science. If we're going to keep on progressing in science, we need more information. And in paleontology, more information is more bones. And the great thing is, I'm happy if it's a nano, I'm happy if it's a juvenile T-Rex, because I got to play a small part in this great debate. When setting out on a quest, no one ever really knows where it will lead. For this fortunate group, a single discovery has affected their lives in exciting and challenging ways they couldn't have anticipated. Volunteers went out there for the first time and, and yeah. just stumbled across this site. I mean, we were really just looking for whatever we could find. It appears the controversy is not over, and this mystery dinosaur, while named by some, remains an enigma. Whether she is a T-Rex, a Nanotyrannus, or another species, her contribution to the world of science is perhaps her greatest benefit. Dormant for tens of millions of years, Jane's discovery has stirred up a torrent of ideas and opinions. Her bones reveal new information in a discipline hungry for more specimens. Meanwhile, the world's greatest scientist